The year is 1916, and the fighting in Western Europe has reached a tense stalemate as each side plans their next move. Along the borders of German-occupied territory, both sides have dug hundreds of miles of muddy trenches between which lay the dreaded no-man's land. Anyone brave enough to attempt a crossing of the land faced certain death, as machine guns on both sides would make quick work of anyone making their way through the fields and barbed wire. This was the scene along the entire western front of the Great War. Weapons like the machine gun and heavy artillery were far stronger than any tactic that could be used to counter them, so both sides were at an impact and dug into their stubborn defenses. It seemed that no one had a solution for trench warfare. But the Allies weren't content with sitting around forever, drinking tea and waiting for a miracle. They were determined to liberate Belgium and the parts of France that Germany had captured. To do so would require as many men as possible, and so, to this end, in January 1916, Britain and France agreed on a joint operation. The British originally wanted to attack Belgium, but eventually agreed to France's proposal, a coordinated full frontal assault into the German lines in France along the Somme River, where the British and French armies met. The initial plan was that France France would lead the attack, with Britain playing a supporting role. This was supposed to be an unprecedented attack after more than a year of stalemate and result in a decisive victory against Germany, but problems arose immediately. In February of 1916, Germany made the first move, breaking the front line's tension by storming the French city of Verdun. To defend their lands and launch their own counterattacks, France diverted hundreds of thousands of their soldiers and reserves to Verdun away from the planned offensive at the Somme. This meant that Britain was now in the driver's seat of the Somme offensive, and although France had transferred away a good portion of their army, there was still a massive number of troops ready for battle. Shared between Britain and France for the offensive were nearly two and a half million soldiers. As with a lot of numbers involved in the world wars, two and a half million is such a large number it can be kind of difficult to grasp, but to put it in perspective, two and a half million people is a little more than the entire population of Houston, Texas, all with a helmet and a rifle ready for war. But there's an important distinction here between quantity and quality. That is a lot of troops, but the majority of British soldiers weren't career soldiers, they were civilian volunteers. At the outbreak of the war, Lord Kitchener had called for volunteers to fight in the war, hoping for at least 100,000, but quickly more than 2 million people signed up. Lots of these young men were in what were known as PAL battalions, or groups of volunteers from the same neighborhood or profession. Despite their eagerness to fight for their country, most of these volunteers had zero combat experience, but at the very least, they'd receive basic training with their rifles and bayonets. Along with all the volunteers from the United Kingdom were troops from all over the British Empire, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, India, and South Africa. General Sir Douglas Haig, overseeing the operation from the British side, wanted to wait until his men had more training, but the French were pressuring him to attack as soon as possible. As plans for the attack evolved, the focus shifted. Instead of an all-out decisive victory that would crush the German army, General Haig now had two goals. Number one, use the attack to split up German resources, relieving the pressure on the French armies at Verdun, and two, take out as many Germans as possible. Recent research into the Somme shows that the Germans were actually aware of the upcoming attack thanks to a couple of interrogated British troops. To what extent this affected the German defensive build-up is a matter of speculation, but what is known is how insanely fortified the German targets were. Behind thick rows of barbed wire, the Germans had dug several rows of deep trenches. Underneath the trenches were concrete bunkers to hide inside during an artillery strike, and above the trenches were machine gun nests manned by experienced and battle-hardened crews. To prepare for the infantry push, British artillery preceded the attack with a non-stop bombardment of German positions for an entire week. Nearly 1,400 guns pounded the front lines with the goal of destroying barbed wire, trenches, and enemy artillery to flatten the enemy defenses and give the infantry what they called a walkover. Over 1.7 million shells were fired during this week, including gas and smoke, to confuse the Germans, but bad weather made it difficult for reconnaissance planes to report on their effectiveness. The shelling was only intended to last for five days, but the thick fog and rain forced the British to delay the infantry push, which they filled with any remaining artillery shells they could scrounge up. It was also during those days that conflicting reports were coming in from scout parties about how effective the artillery had been. Some groups reported flattened barbed wire and clear paths to the German lines, while others reported almost no change. Despite the conflicting reports, it was unthinkable to cancel the attack or delay it again, so General Haig ordered the men to begin the assault. 
At 7.30 a.m. on July 1, 1916, whistles rang out across the countryside, signaling the beginning of the attack. The goals for the first day were to capture and hold the two lines of German defense, with the British Third Army creating a diversion in the north, the British Fourth Army heading the main attack near the center, and the French Sixth Army attacking in the south. Heavy explosives buried under German strongholds were detonated, and the Allied forces began the final artillery strike before the assault. Some British troops began marching across no man's land before the barrage even ended, hoping to catch the Germans off guard, while some assumed a steady pace after the artillery finished, expecting decimated defenses and little to no resistance. One soldier was so confident that he kicked a football across the field as the push began. But their expectations were pretty far from reality. It would later be discovered that nearly a third of all artillery shells fired the week before had been duds, and thousands more were shrapnel shells that were ineffective against barbed wire. To make it all worse, the artillery had been insufficient for such a large area, and many pieces remained unscathed. In the places that did get bombed, the concrete bunkers kept the Germans safe, and they were ready to jump back to the positions as soon as it ended. The barrage also failed to disable German artillery and its communication lines with the front trenches. Some British divisions made it across parts of no man's land, taking heavy casualties along the way, but temporarily securing key locations and villages. The British Third Army in the north struggled to make any progress between the trenches as German machine guns rained hell upon the soldiers, cramming through the few gaps in the barbed wire. The British and French divisions in the southern sector saw the most success, taking thousands of prisoners and completing their first day objectives, largely thanks the French artillery being more effective than its British counterpart. But the British Fourth Army in the center of the push saw the worst outcome of them all, barely making progress, essentially sitting ducks in barbed wire for coordinated enemy artillery strikes and the wall of machine guns. They were mowed down. They were massacred in the thousands. In a nutshell, this was the outcome of the first day. Some success in the south, but large-scale failure everywhere else. In many places, temporary ceasefires were called for each side to recover their wounded from no man's land, and, and the cost of the war was realized when the staggering counts came in. In just one day, the Germans had between six and 12,000 casualties, while the French had a few thousand wounded or killed. But the British, they suffered a staggering 57,000 casualties, a third of which had been killed, with almost no results to show for it. The first day of the Somme has been called the worst day in the history of the British Army. Entire PALS battalions have been wiped out, leaving whole communities back home, sharing the burden of losing their sons, some of whom were killed, without even having a chance to fire their own rifle. In fact, as a result of this, the British Army discontinued PALS battalions. Now, this is often where the story of the Somme ends, with a failure to break through the German lines and the tragic loss of life, with much of the blame often placed on the generals leading inexperienced boys into war. But the reality is, the Battle of the Somme is much more than just the first day. In fact, it raged on. For another five months. The first day of the Somme was also the beginning of the Battle of Albert, the Allied plans for the first two weeks of the Somme offensive. From July the 2nd to the 13th, each side threw everything they had to gain some kind of advantage in the chaos with very mixed results. It took a couple of days to replace the soldiers lost on the first push, but once they were in place, new offensives began. On July the 3rd, British divisions rushed forward and managed to capture the small village of Labassal. For the next few days, they tried their luck pushing into German trenches 200 meters behind it and were successful on the 7th of July. Later that day, Welsh divisions were ordered to capture positions in the Mammoth's Wood, where several German defensive positions were heavily fortified. After a preliminary artillery strike, the Welsh were completely repelled, suffering hundreds of casualties as the artillery strike had once again failed to destroy much of the barbed wire. The teams pushed forward again the next day with the same result. General Haig was irritated by the failure, citing what he saw as a lack of effort, and removed several Welsh officers from their duties. After a quick reassessment of their forces, he ordered further assaults with more men. The Welsh once again went into the fray, this time making it all the way to the German position, and by July the 12th, after intense close-quarter combat with rifles and bayonets, they managed to clear the area of German soldiers and capture anyone who surrendered. In just the few days of fighting at Mehmet's Wood, the Welsh division lost 4,000 men and wouldn't recover their losses for another year. Today, in memory of the attack at Mehmet's Wood and the men lost, stands a memorial featuring the Welsh Red Dragon.
just north of the Metz wood, was another intense battle. This one for the village of Contamaison. The first day on the Somme was a disaster for the British attempt to take the small town. Within 10 minutes of jumping out of their trenches, 80% of the advancing men were mown down by German machine guns. Subsequent pushes had made it to just the edges of the objective, but ultimately, they had to withdraw from their positions. A German counterattack from the village was then crushed, and the British drew up more plans to try and capture it once again. Suddenly, there was a perfect opportunity to attack. On July 4th, a heavy thunderstorm was bearing down on the whole battlefield, turning trenches into muddy rivers and flooding bunkers. The British infantry, concealed by the rain and their sound masked by the thunder, crept forward until they were just 90 meters from the German position. Once the order was given, the men rushed forward, storming the trenches in front of the villagers. They quickly captured several key trenches and took hundreds of prisoners, and even managed to capture the heavily defended Horseshoe Trench, but it was recaptured by a German counterattack later that day. From their newly captured trenches, the British regrouped and prepared for another assault on Contamaison. After bombarding the German trenches and barbed wire once again, the infantry made their way across no man's land, but to no avail. Once again, the same old story. Intense machine gun fire and barbed wire that the shells failed to destroy. Many units returned to their starting positions that very night. Finally, on the 10th of July, the infantry was able to capture the village using a ballsy tactic known as a creeping barrage, a strategy originally tested years earlier in Bulgaria. In a creeping barrage, the infantry would steadily march across no man's land toward enemy trenches, walking carefully behind a scheduled wall of artillery fire that moved forward at a set pace. Essentially, shells would drop and explode in front of the men as they walked, concealing their position with explosions and smoke and destroying barbed wire just before they got to it. The pace of the advancing barrage was generally between 50 and 100 yards every minute and would stop right as the men made it to the enemy trenches. This would give the Germans no time to resume their defenses after the barrage ended and the British troops would already be storming their positions. But this kind of tactic required well-trained infantry and even more well-trained artillery teams, something the British were in short supply of at the time. British attempts at creeping barrages all over the Somme resulted in thousands of soldiers moving at the wrong pace, either walking too slowly and being left too far from the trenches when the barrage ended, or moving forward too quickly and becoming a friendly fire statistic. In the case of Contamaison, the soldiers' pace was too quick, but luckily the divisional artillery commander saw what was happening and sped up the artillery pace to stay ahead of the marching troops. This saved their lives and the operation. The village was captured, and thousands of casualties mounted up on either side as the Germans retreated to supporting trenches behind the town. Now, in one video, we can't possibly cover every individual battle that took place here, but suffice to say, all along the Somme front line, back and forth fighting raged on for weeks. In several instances, the British would, by some miracle, make it to enemy trenches and capture their objectives, but would have to fall back when they received no reinforcements, no support, and even no further orders. A German counterattack would often show up and knock them back to the starting line. To further complicate things, the Allied communication lines were terribly unreliable, with very few reliable telephone lines. British officers often received news of a battle's outcome hours after the facts, with letters being delivered by messengers, reconnaissance pilots, or even homing pigeons. All of this, and the seemingly unshakable German defenses, meant that even though thousands of men were dying every day, there wasn't a lot of tangible progress being made. Throughout late July, August, and early September, each side ramped up their efforts to gain a tactical advantage along the front line, throwing whatever resources they had at the enemy trenches. One major stronghold of the German defenses was a fortress they had constructed close to the front lines at Thiepval, which had proven to be unbreakable. After failed attempts to attack it, the Allies decided on a different approach. Instead of the traditional method of throwing artillery and men straight at the target, they were going to take their time and capture the surrounding villages, which would give them more favorable positions to attack from. The most the important village for this plan was Pozier, which sat on the plateau overlooking Sleepval from behind. The British attacked it on July the 22nd after several days of bombardment, not just with explosive shells, but also the deadly gas phosgene. After the bombing ended, the Australian 1st and 3rd Brigades rushed the enemy positions, quickly taking control of several key trenches, forcing any remaining Germans to fall back. Later that day, the Australians captured dozens of prisoners and a heavily fortified position known as Gibraltar Bunker. After reinforcements arrived, they tried to push even further into enemy territory, but were held off. German communication lines were also suffering, so they weren't actually aware of Poisier's capture until two days later. But the moment they heard the news, they focused all their energy into taking it back. Beginning on the 24th of July, there was a German shelling so concentrated that it turned much of the village into rubble. One place was bombed so heavily that it later became known 
as Dead Man's Road. The shelling and counterattacks lasted for two weeks, and when the survivors were finally relieved from their positions, they were described as men who had been in hell, drawn and haggard and so dazed that they appeared to be walking in a dream, and their eyes looked glassy and starey. After the shell-shocked men returned to base, it was counted that the Australian 1st Division had suffered more than 5,000 casualties. As September arrived, there was a sense of urgency growing among the Allied generals. They needed to gain as much ground as possible during autumn, because once winter arrived, they would be at the mercy of the weather. A renewed major operation was planned, in which the British forces would push through three consecutive German defensive lines. Green Line, then Brown Line, then Blue Line. This would later be known as the Battle of fleur Cosselet. It was an ambitious plan, but the British came prepared. The idea was to have deep flanks pushed on the sides of the battlefield, through which cavalry could be used to charge enemy infantry, leaving the center to crumble after the infantry followed a creeping barrage into enemy trenches. The Canadian Corps and the New Zealand Division were getting their first combat, and most notably, the tank was used in battle for the first time in history. As early as 1914, both sides of the war had been experimenting with armored vehicles, but none of them had made it to the battlefield. And that was about to change, however, as the British brought with them not one, not two, but 49 Mark I tanks, each weighing around 30 tons. The Mark I came in two versions, male and female. The male versions were armed with two powerful six-pounder guns and three Hotchkiss machine guns, while the female versions came equipped with five machine guns. The battle began on September the 15th. The German defenders, seeing the tank in battle for the first time in their lives, were understandable scared shitless. It ran over barbed wire like it was bubble wrap and was nearly immune to small arms fire, driving straight toward enemy positions and opening fire, drawing attention from the infantry and leaving a corridor for them through the barbed wire. Well, that's what happens when the tank worked like it was supposed to. Right off the bat, one tank failed to start, another one lost its caterpillar tracks and had to turn around, a few ran out of fuel, another got stuck in a ditch, and several just got lost. They were almost hilariously unreliable, and their crews just weren't very experienced, but the ones that did make it to their objectives had quite an impact on the battle. The 2nd New Zealand Brigade, for example, made it through several trenches, but were stopped in their path by barbed wire, which was promptly run over by two tanks, allowing the men to advance and capture the next point. In a few places, the Germans were able to come up with ways to counter the tanks, such as destroying them with focused artillery. Innovation took place in the sky as well that day. Germany deployed their brand new Albatross D-1 fighter planes, which seriously challenged British and French air superiority, shooting down observation balloons and other reconnaissance planes. It wasn't exceptionally maneuverable, but it made up for this with heavy machine guns and incredible speed. Back on the ground, things were finally going well for the British. After about a week, the Allies dug into a new front line, signaling the end of this particular attack. The overarching goal of taking all three German lines wasn't achieved, but a significant amount of territory had been taken. Three major villages were recaptured, and the British had pushed about two kilometers into enemy territory. So while it wasn't technically a strategic victory, victory according to the original plan, it had been a tactical success, and it showed how much the British Army had improved since the disastrous first day of the Somme. This battle had also wiped out a huge portion of Germany's forces. In fact, September became their worst month of casualties. Operations continued throughout October and November, but as the weather worsened, both sides saw fewer and fewer chances to attack. November the 18th is regarded as the last day of the Battle of the Somme, which lasted 140 days. Throughout the months of fighting, the British Empire suffered around 420,000 casualties, the French 200,000, and Germany over 450,000. Some estimates go as high as 600. And 50, in total, over a million casualties, and also that the front lines could shift between 6 and 10 miles, or between 9 and 16 kilometers. Whether or not this was a victory, or even necessary, is still up for debate. The Battle of the Somme, and World War I in general, is often described by the phrase, lions led by donkeys, or in other words, brave young men dying on the battlefield under the orders of incompetent generals who were too busy drinking wine to come up with a solid plan. In the final series of the BBC sitcom Blackadder, Robin Atkinson's character remarks, If you mean, are we all to get killed? Yes. Clearly, Field Marshal Haig is about to make yet another gargantuan effort to move his drinks cabinet six inches closer to Berlin. This is certainly a valid interpretation of the Battle of the Somme. But on the other hand, Haig was indeed pressured to attack where he previously didn't want to, and had to do so with an inexperienced army. The British Army gained valuable experience on how to command a large army against the Germans. They began to master artillery strikes and creeping barrages, and how to fight an entrenched war. It was essentially a painful learning curve 
for the British Army. And of course, no retelling is complete without mention of several famous figures who fought there. The fighting shaped the thinking and morals of authors C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, and in the other trenches, a young Adolf Hitler was hit with shrapnel which wounded him either in the leg or, according to some sources, it resulted in the loss of a testicle. Overall, the Battle of the Somme, as costly as it was for the Allies, did have a serious impact on the outcome of the First World War. Germany's casualties were extreme, and the men they lost were experienced and hard to replace. Having to divert their forces to the Somme meant that they had less firepower at Verdun, where the French emerged victorious. It was a grueling battle of the wearing down of German resources, which was the overall goal of Britain, France, and Russia at the time. This destructive war of attrition continued and drained Germany's power, crippling its war economy and contributing to the country downfall at the end of the war. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you'd like another video about war in Europe, please do check out our video on Operation Gomorrah, which I will link to on the screen now. And thanks for watching.